I, I, I could see the reflection on the back of the cathedral. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of those little lights that are flashing around yeah. on the, and, off the wall. And, and I was asked, for example, uh, by the ladies who were putting up the exhibit over St. Ursula's, mm -hmm. uh, as a woman who had taught art and so forth, had been an Ursula nun herself, and at the age of 45, went to medical school. And she's now a neurologist. And uh, working here in town, office up in Mount Auburn, there, where the old school used to be. And uh, but they want to know what what were the use of the rings. And I said to keep the attention where it should be. <laughs> and if I make a gesture. Which I, don't, which I don't make very many of them at all. But, but if I make a gesture, the attention isn't someplace else. It's, it's, it's where the flash point is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and you, you mentioned something the other day about uh, is it better to stay away from, you know, the academic language, uh, no, it's not better to stay away from the academic language because the it's 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 a way to make the common language acceptable. When you start out using the word entertain and immediately the reaction is well, we don't go to church to be entertained, do we? Of course, and then my comeback is, well, you can either entertain or bored. There are no in-betweens. <laughs> you know, either you're pregnant or you're not. Either you're alive or you're dead. There are no in-betweens. Either you're entertained or you're bored. There are no in-betweens. And, but the point is, if you've got an academic and scholastic philosophical background to help, it's all to the good. Mm -hmm. It's all to the good. But speaking of that, in terms of a, a, a classical reference, you talked about uh, worship having characteristics of, I think, what Aristotle called in the poetics, a beginning, a middle, and an end. What does that mean with regard to a worship? Are you going to change the ending? <laughs> Are you going to change the plot? Or, no, what, it means, what does that mean? basically all Aristotle meant was that was what Aristotle should have meant, if he didn't mean it. <laughs> was it you must start from some position. There must be movement and a conclusion. That's all that means. The point is, uh, and it and and it, and it all has to cohere. It all has to hang together, because you can't have movement that doesn't cohere. How do you do that when? It's pretty much laid out. It's prescribed. What the formulations of there's always going to be a tension between the unstructured tradition of the faith and the artistic needs of the worship itself to be structured, and that is at the heart of what. I think I know how to do, and practically nobody else except a rare individual knows how. And I don't think anybody has ever done it and is able to express or to articulate what they do and how it's done. Um, and I didn't come, off, come upon it all of a sudden. 
uh, it just seemed at the beginning very odd to me as a young priest that we proceed from prayers at the foot of the altar to Dominus Vobiscum to a colic prayer or to before that to a Kyrie and to a Gloria and there's no psychological reason for going in that direction. It has to be supplied, otherwise things stand still. But if you make them connect, if you can connect them, so there's a reason from going to Kyrie, to Gloria, to prayer, to read, then you, you have what Aristotle talks about, movement. That, and that and and that's all we that's all we need to get from that Arist Aristotelian uh, critique of 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 of, uh, of course his critique of was a tragedy we don't know what he would have done with comedy <laughs> Aristotle only saw one play he ever liked and that was Oedipus <laughs> and the whole. And the whole of his poetics is based on Oedipus. <laughs> but, but just so you're not a fundamentalist about Aristotle's rules, and you know what's behind them, then that makes it, uh, if you're not a fundamentalist and, and you know what's behind it, it helps you. It, help, it helps worship greatly, because worship, you have to accept the fact that worship is a complex of the arts, and in itself is an art form made up of many arts, and is subject to the same rules, whether they're written or unwritten. But let's look at it, say an example of um, some worship, some, whether it's a feast, whether it's a, a wedding, a, a funeral. I know this is probably something that, that works better seeing it and, and participating in it rather than talking about it. But it, it, it's that goes without saying about anything. <laughs> but, it's, uh, <laughs> but we're in ocular mode here, so <laughs> so we need to, to talk about you know what what kind of what these transitions. What do you do to help give this the worship service an arc, if you will? Okay. It's not so much an arc; it's movement. You got to go from someplace and get to someplace. You can't just sit there. So what do you do? Um, first of all, I want to go back to the, to the things you mentioned, like wedding, funerals. Those and great feasts, those are the occasions on which the rules would be useful, but, not all, but are not always necessary <laughs> because people bring to that an ambience that within themselves that colors everything that happens, especially weddings and funerals and stuff like that. But otherwise, you must start with, for lack of a better word, something I call a theme. And the theme had best be based on something that is in the readings of the day, so the, one of the scriptural passages of the day. Uh, and sometimes the theme can be something that's a part of each of the scripture passages. And the 
theme gives you the possibility of, of all that clutter of the faith that's out there, that rich clutter is diffused light. And in order to get clear vision of something, you have to focus the lens. In order to get warm, you must focus it even further. By warmth, I mean emotion. Uh, but you start with uh, motion and emotion. So those things are all related. Um, but if I, if, if I start with uh, a theme selected from, I used to say, well, the theme should be something that's relevant to the community. And we'd start out with, today we're going to celebrate such and such. And if the readings didn't live up to that, we got rid of the readings. It's not a good idea. It's not a good idea. First of all, it puts you in the position of being a scriptural fundamentalist. That if the scripture did not say something precisely didactic about the theme, then it's not useful to the theme that you're using. And that's not always true. And the savior in all of this is the imagination. So you now accept the given readings for a day? The fathers of the church who put together the texts with some thought and some purpose, and who over a period, who expected that over a period of time, the congregation would be exposed to, if not every passage of scripture, at least a good chunk of the whole of scripture. And that's one reason for not violating what they have done. And the second reason, a second reason is that uh, the thing I mentioned before, uh, if your theme is not approached imaginatively with scripture, then you, you, you bind yourself into something that's akin to scriptural fundamentalism, that it means no more than the exact literal thing that you read. Uh, it took me some time to come to that. Because I knew more about Aristotle than I knew about scripture. And mm, I was down in Nashville. doing a workshop in worship for the, for the Diocese of Nashville. And on the climax of the workshop was a mass at the cathedral on Sunday. And we were there to talk about the contributions of nigritude or black culture to the Church Catholic, universal. Well, one of the readings that day was St. Peter being delivered from jail by the angel. Now, if you're going to approach it fundamentalistically, <laughs> if to make up a word, there's no connection get rid of that one and put another reading in. I didn't know. And I thought about it a while. And 
that one came rather easily, imaginatively. That negritude was a liberating angel to bring the church of Peter out of its prison in which it basically encased itself and that that mm -hmm. made it mm -hmm. that made it. it it not only gave the gift of negritude uh, it not only made the gift of negritude sound relevant to the rest of the church, but here was a specific, very dramatic incident which is used to peg it on to. As, and, 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 and preaching should be poetic anyway. It should not be literal didacticism. I don't think. Well, isn't that, I mean, that's a common recurring criticism if the priest uh, simply recounts in the course <laughs> of a homily what you just what you read. Just read. <laughs> what he explains it to you as if you could not understand <laughs> the same words. Of course, well, now, one well, thing must be said is that the words do not always mean what they seem to mean. And in some cases, there may be a necessity or a reason for explaining. But you don't always have to explain everything that's in the scripture in order to preach appropriately. So what's the role of the priest in all this? It would seem to me that the priest, by his very nature as priest, has only one role in the church, that is caring for worship. And our priests ought to be the script writers, the producers, directors of worship, besides being presiders at worship. If the presider is also the scriptwriter and the producer and the director, we have much less of a problem. But the point is, anybody can do that. You don't have to be a priest to do that. And besides and beyond that, we're talking about not priest, we're talking about ordained persons. Priesthood of Christ comes to us through baptism. We are, we are incorporated into Christ the priest at baptism. There's only one priest of the New Testament. Jesus the Christ. Now, we are incorporated into Christ at baptism. Ordination is the social permission to exercise a certain power. It came out of the fourth century, out of Constantine's appointing bishops to reign over his provinces, which he called dioceses. And he gave them orders, like he gave the rest of his soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> the church militant. <laughs> the church. I don't know that that came directly from there, but certainly the church coming out of the catacombs into the light, you know, and becoming almost an established religion under Constantine. Uh, took on much of what its leader at the time which was not the Pope of Rome, it was Constantine. Well, on this question of worship and the priest, how do you, um, 
I mean, you, you talk about the priest as the, the primary role is the, the caring of worship. And, and, and but, but then I also said that priest qua priest embodies the whole of the baptized faith. Okay, but now, but priest the ordained, priest is a, is, is the ordained teacher, runner of festivals. I mean, <laughs> it was Constantine who made them administrators. Up until that time, they were not admin. The, the 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 bishops of the church were not administrators. There was not a clear distinction between bishops, priests, etc. But Constantine, in establishing Episcopos, overseers in his dioceses, bishops, made administration, civil administration, not church administration, civil administration, their first work. And so when they came back to running the church itself, of course, they did it just as they did civil administration. And so we're saddled with administrators now instead of pastors, frequently. It's the rare bishop who rises above it. Do you know or sense your... Oh, your when I say not, not just bishop, but pastors in general. Mm -hmm. uh, are caught up by uh, a plethora of administrative details. So it takes up his whole week. He doesn't have time to prepare Sunday worship. So obviously you look at that is that is probably the central role of the priest. But but yeah. Uh, the central role of the priesthood. Of the individual, we can't say it's necessary to the central role. But it's the central role of the priesthood of Christ. Um, I guess presumably if there was someone in a given church uh, that had a congregation that had particular gifts that were far exceeded the priest, the presiding priest, then you would say... You could, could help the priest put it together. And, and, and uh, uh, a friend of mine who worked with me for a very, very long time uh, picked up a lot of this stuff just, just by working with me. That's how I know an apprenticeship program can work. And he is now chief liturgist for, under the bishop for one of the Midwestern dioceses. Because the bishop saw the way he handled himself in a given set of circumstances. He called him apart and he said uh, he wanted him to be his musician. And I got a call about three o'clock in the morning and said, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I said, what he's really asking you is to be his liturgist. And since you are the few people who can do it, you have no right to turn it down. <laughs> I said, you rewrite what it is you would do for the bishop if you accepted this job. And so he wrote it, not as chief musician, but as chief liturgist of the diocese, and the bishop accepted that. They talked back and forth on it. Then I kept putting my two cents in. <laughs> because he, he was one of the capable people, you know, one of the few capable people who understood a great deal of this. Uh, being given an opportunity. Usually you're given this because you went to school and you got a degree in worship. And a degree in worship doesn't give you necessarily competence in worship at all. Um, 
how do you change the hearts and minds of churchgoers from passive and detached attendees to active, contributing, and emotionally involved worshipers? Or can you? Obviously, you, 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 you believe presume, you can. You presume, first of all, that they're human beings. And any drama, whether it is in the so-called legitimate theater or in the drama of worship, will attract and involve them if it has certain characteristics. If they see it, they don't have to see it consciously, but if it, if, it, if it touches them as being something relevant, uh, something of interest, etc. Now, one of the things that you detached, meaning, you know, spectator, you have to have more than just interest. And because you have to have a certain facility for doing what it is that one does in worship. So the congregation needs training in order not to be detached. They must have a facility for doing what they do well. It's not amateur hour at worship time. <laughs> It's not amateur hour for the priests, it is an amateur hour for the servers, it is certainly not amateur hour for the congregation, which is the chief witness of the faith. It must be trained to do its job well. It doesn't mean formal training, obviously. But if they don't know how to sing out and express their faith, with, you know, with the fullest kinds of expression, well then, they have to be taught how to do it. With regard to that, can I be very emotionally involved in worship, but quietly, if you will, in quotes, um, so that it may appear that I'm uninvolved. That's possible. But if everybody were that quiet, there would be no worship, no public worship. Uh, that excuse an individual can take. I'm involved, but I'm quiet. But this is public worship. And if I'm going to participate in public worship, I have to do it in a way that expresses something to the world at large, not just within me. And as a member of the priesthood of Christ, as every member of the congregation is, I have some obligation to, I have no right to automatically choose to be a, a quiet participant. On occasion, I can, sure. Mm -hmm. On lots of occasions, I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, but, if, but you, you, you see what happens when, if the whole congregation yeah. takes on that yeah. same you don't have anything. And that's been the basic problem. Mm -hmm. That kind of attitude has been the basic problem of worship, I would say, from the Middle Ages up through now. It's in, first of all, an internal thing. And it never gets external, which is the very nature of sacraments. 
And of course, if you go by only internal, then you don't have to have all those arts and skills to do things with. We're still recording. <laughs> We're still recording, but I'm going to take a drink in the meantime. My mouth is dry. Let me stop this for a second. So yeah, it's 